Welcome back, everybody. Episode 61. We're flying through these guys. We're almost a year into the podcast, and recently we got over 100,000 downloads. It's a celebration, people. It's a clear celebration. So thank you for all the support. Thank you for listening. We are super appreciative of all the love. All right. Before jumping into it, we're going to talk about some housekeeping things. Number one, did y'all catch our virtual summit on low-carbon keto approaches to health? If you didn't, we have the recorded version for $29.95 on our website, solvinghealthcare.ca backslash low-carb. We had Ivor Cummins, we had Joy Kitty, and we had the Dr. Paul Mason in the mix. And I got to tell you, the feedback has been incredible, really smart intellectual discussions we had on there talking about the benefits of low carbon keto and who are ideal patients for it what to expect how quickly metabolic profile could be turned around it was awesome so yeah jump on that and uh, thanks for the support in advance all right guys let me introduce you to our guest rob wolf he is incredible biochemist trained Super knowledgeable when it comes to the health space, specifically nutrition and fitness. Why we have him on the show, he's been part of some unbelievable initiatives, including the Reno Project, where they did a pilot project looking at 40 firefighters and police officers and improved their metabolic profile to the point where they roughly saved $22 million in healthcare expenses. So brilliant. Is the founder of the Healthy Rebellion which is an online platform to improve clients' metabolic profile. We're going to get into it. You're going to love what the magic they're creating. He hosts a podcast, The Healthy Rebellion Radio, author of great books such as Wired to Eat, which I just finished, Ballin, Sacred Cow, which we'll talk about too. Guys, this guy's full of knowledge. He's full of game, and it's a true privilege to have him on the show. So without further ado, Rob Wolf, let's go. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quedro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost-effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Quadcast Nation, can I tell you, I've been jammed up, excited for weeks for this one, guys. We got the legendary Rob Wolf in the mix. Welcome to the Quadcast, my friend. Huge honor to be here. I am happy to bring down property values anywhere I go, so thank you. (laughs) Oh, man. So this, I mean, I don't know where to start with Rob, because not only is he a podcaster, not only is he an author, but also the founder of the Healthy Rebellion. And honestly, maybe a good place to start, Rob, is your health history. Like what got you into the whole nutrition space? You seem like you've always been an athletic guy, but what got you into the uh, nutrition world? Yeah, you know, before we recorded, like we were kind of talking a little bit about like our our parents' generation and how I'm I'm almost 50. And I remember when my dad was 50, like he just seemed old, like he had a lot of health problems. He smoked, he drank, like, you know, he, he had some, you know, cards pretty stacked against him. But I remember talking to my mom gosh, I, I was pretty young, but I said to her, man, wouldn't you want to live to be 100? And she said, oh, no. I was like, why? And she's like, well, I would just hurt and, you know, life would be terrible. And I was kind of like, wait a second here, you know, if you take care of yourself, it doesn't have to be that way. And I mean, I was maybe like six, seven, eight years old, something like that. So I had a sense that there was probably a better way of doing things than what my family of origin did. And uh, so I've always been interested in health and human performance. I was a California state powerlifting champion, a very long time ago. <laughs> I have been interested in martial arts. Like I used to do Thai boxing. I do some old guy Brazilian jiu-jitsu now. But this this led me into an undergrad in biochemistry. And I was trying to figure out if I was going to do a research route or go to medical school. And it was around this time that I had a massive health crisis. I developed ulcerative colitis 
so bad that at the age of 26, they were recommending a bowel resection. And I knew enough about medicine at that point that I knew that heading down that road of a bowel resection was a terrible idea for my long-term health and not addressing the problem of ulcerative colitis was also going to be terrible. It's, you know, immunosuppressant drugs, surgery, like Western medicine really doesn't have great solutions for a lot of these chronic degenerative diseases. It does an amazing job if you get hit by a bus or fall off a roof or something like that. But then when we get outside of like trauma, Western medicine is just not that impressive. Like it can kind of kick the can, but we don't have really good solutions. So it, it was interesting. I was chatting with my mom on the phone and this is back in 1998. And my mom had had health issues for as long as I could remember. And they were very similar to what I had. And looking back, it was uh, GI and autoimmune related problems. But she went to her rheumatologist and he ran this really extensive battery of tests and he told her that she was intolerant to grains, legumes, and dairy. And she told me that, and that she was diagnosed with uh, celiac disease, Sjogren's, lupus, about eight different interrelated autoimmune conditions. As she was relating this to me, I was like, this sounds like everything I've got going on. So I started thinking and doing some research, but I was thinking, no grains, no legumes, no dairy. What on earth do you eat if you don't eat that, you know? I mean, what, what do you eat? And it was this kind of free association process. I was like, okay, grains and legumes, those are kind of like agriculture. That came with like the development of civilization. Before that, there was this whole Paleolithic gig. And then I, I had heard about this thing called a Paleolithic diet. So I went into my house, turned on the computer, waited for it to cycle up. Then I turned on the, you know, waited for the dial up to get going. And then there was a new search engine that I put into this new thing called Google that I put into <laughs> it, a Paleolithic Diet. And there was a little bit of information. There was a guy, Lauren Cordain, and another guy, Arthur Devaney. And everything they were talking about, you know, that Lauren Cordain had just published this paper uh, cereal grains, humanity's double-edged sword. And he made this case that we wouldn't have civilization as we know it now without agriculture, but unbeknownst to most people, particularly interestingly within the health, general health field, that our pre-industrial forebears were really remarkably healthy. They had high infant mortality. They had a lot of infectious disease. There was a lot of you know, violence among people and stuff like that. But by and large, people were remarkably healthy when you consider the absence of like public health initiatives and vaccinations and all this other stuff. And one of the big things that was mentioned again and again in these papers was gastrointestinal related problems, IBS, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. So I was kind of like, man, I've got nothing else to lose. And at this point I was living in Seattle, looking at a couple of different grad programs and I was eating a vegan diet. And like I had gone to everybody, the Georgia Shawa Macrobiotic Institute, followed Dr. McDougall, and it just wasn't working for me. Like everything I ate, it came out about the same way that it went in. And I was just kind of at my wits end. So I, I tried what was basically a lowish carb paleo type diet, keto type diet. And it was shocking how rapidly I regained a massive chunk of my health. And then it's been 22 years of tinkering with different things to continue to improve. Like I've, I've learned to better regulate the intensity of my exercise. I've really learned that sunlight is like a non-negotiable feature of my health. We just moved to New Brunfels, Texas a year ago, and it getting out in the sun every day, getting in water, swimming. It was like this last five or 10% of my digestive health story and kind of my mental health story that has just been really striking. And uh, I guess right around that time, around 2000, 2001, I was continuing to poke around online and I found this wacky workout called CrossFit. And I started following it. And a good friend of mine, Dave Warner, who's a retired Navy SEAL, he and I started working out together. And before we know it, in his garage, we had like 15 people that we were training. And I reached out to the founders of CrossFit. I was pretty active on their early message board. and said, hey, we want to open a gym and we'd like to call it CrossFit. And they said, do it. Go be Achieve. And so that was CrossFit North, which was the first CrossFit affiliate gym in the world. And then I had a chance to move back to Chico, California, where I did my undergrad. And I opened CrossFit NorCal, NorCal Strength and Conditioning. 
And that was the fourth CrossFit gym in the world. So I was really early in both this paleo diet scene and the CrossFit scene. I worked for CrossFit HQ for a number of years. And when you, you look at kind of the Google trends of like paleo and CrossFit, they just went in lockstep together. Like they really grew and really declined largely in lockstep together. But it was cool in that both in the, the gym and then working with just tens of thousands of people around the world, these kind of niggling health issues that people just assume are normal, like psoriasis and heartburn and you know, all these kind of low-level autoimmune conditions, I would just put out the crazy notion of like, hey, why don't you try doing this kind of lowish carb paleo type diet for 30 days, remove grains, legumes, and dairy, then reintroduce them and see how you do. And that that first book, The Paleo Solution, is sold close to a million copies at this point. Like it's really done well and like, I'm not good looking, I'm not particularly smart. The only reason why this thing is done as well as it has is I make a really compelling case that like, if you aren't happy with your current status, mm. you've got 30 days and if what I recommend sucks, then okay, you lost 30 days. But if what I recommend is helps get you closer to a bullseye, then we can really, you know, if what we're putting forward is, is true, that this kind of ancestral health model could be really valuable, we could move you from being really out on the edge of health to getting very close to the middle. And then we can tinker and iterate and figure out what the, the specific needs of folks are. But we can start with that just kind of broad brushstroke thing of, get lots of sleep, get as much sunlight as you can have, develop awesome community and have a, a real purpose to your life, you know, have something that's important above and beyond your own existence. And then have some thought towards ancestral type eating, you know, something that, that harkens back to this ancestral health approach and in kind of broad brushstrokes like that's that's been the last, you know, 22 years of working in this area. Wow. And I guess what I really love about that story is, you know, I know you're saying you're not a bunch of things, but you're very educated. You're very well read and any advice comes with some backing, you know, like a certain level of evidence. And the thing I love about your approach is that it's not dogmatic. It's not everybody has to be paleo. Not everyone has to be keto. It's what works for you. But the key, you know, to this approach is like, hey, let's have a bit of a reset. Let's stop what we're doing right now. And, you know, as you said, it might be 30 days of difficult times. Right. But, you know, once we're there and we have that reset, 30 days, potentially your life to really improve your life. And if you're not, if things aren't improved, well, I'm sorry, it's 30 days. But yeah, the key thing that I loved hearing about you too is just that personalized approach, which I think is something maybe it's new to me but it's relatively novel to hear about when it comes to nutrition and as a layman you know what yeah. i mean thank you and you know it's it's definitely been iterative like i was definitely much more of a hardliner with different things early on but i i really did in the process of just breaking people of giving them bad advice that we, you know there's this what they call it the survivorship bias you yeah. know like I had all these people that were getting these great results with this kind of uh, basic approach that I had. And then one day, I remember it was, I don't know if it was on the CrossFit message board or where it was, I saw someone that had interacted with me a lot and they were kind of complaining about some problems. And I was like, hey, why didn't you talk to me about this? And the gal was like, well, I really like you, you're a nice person, but I, I didn't want to bum you out that what you had recommended didn't work. And it was really kind of like a wet fish over the head. I was like, oh man, like I need to really think a lot about this. And so it, it's an interesting thing. I think about it like using a microscope where you go from very high level to augering in and people are just overwhelmed with information. Like we hear that all the time. We're like, well, this guy says this and that guy says that. And so there's a kind of a dueling banjos in my mind between we need these big picture heuristics, these simple stories that can at least get folks going in a half decent direction. But then the danger is that people write these things in stone tablets and turn it into religious doctrine. And then you don't have the ability to customize and tinker and fiddle because I think we're going to talk a little bit later. We did a project in Reno where we identified 40 people at high risk within the police and fire service 
at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We modified their diet and lifestyle, tracked them for the two-year period. But their metabolic health improved so much that it's estimated that that pilot study alone saved the city of Reno $22 million. Yes. Which is awesome. And about 5% of the people in there didn't thrive on the low-carb approach that we recommended. There were a a cross-section of people that their numbers got worse, their body composition got worse. And we got in and really looked at these people They were insulin resistant. They were dyslipidemic. But those folks really benefited from a high protein, low fat, moderate to high carb diet. It looks like a standard bodybuilder diet. And when we tweaked the parameters on those people, it was just magic for them. So it's interesting. We had these kind of two two camps. One camp really benefited from reducing carbohydrate intake. And then it kind of varied where they played out somewhere at 50 grams a day, somewhere at 100 grams a day. But there was another group of people that the high fat intake was not working for them. And so we really needed to be able to, one, identify that, yeah, metabolic syndrome and metabolic disease is a big, big deal and it has to be addressed. It it takes people's lives prematurely. It dramatically shortens their health span. So that like when we were talking about it originally, like my dad's lifespan and health span were terrible because of the poor metabolic health that he had, you know? So we, we need to address that. But then in the addressing of it, we need to be able to tinker and fine tune and, and be absolutely willing to abandon ship if what we're recommending isn't legitimately helping people. Like this should be a very transparent and honest process. It shouldn't be a faith-driven process. There's lots of places in life to have a faith-driven process. Health and, and wellness ain't it, you know? I mean, and again, 30 days should tell you if, it, if it's really not feeling good, there's probably some other thing that we should do to get there. Absolutely. And I'm going to be a bit repetitive, guys, because the Reno Project is one of the sexiest things that I've heard in a while. So just to be clear, so you worked with, it was 40 it was firefighters and police officers, right? Yeah, we really stacked the deck. We screened hundreds and then pulled yeah. out the 40 sickest. Yeah. In terms of screening, just out of curiosity, how many were you, like what numbers were needed to screen? We just screened everybody. Everybody, so it was okay. several hundred of the police and fire. Yeah, okay, and perfect. also we, we ended up looking at most of the city workers too, but the study itself was constrained to the police and fire, which actually is part of the reason why it did so well in that context. And also part of the reason why it's been so difficult to replicate elsewhere, because it's a paramilitary organization and they can really put the screws to people to make them comply. Right. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think there's some out of the box thinking personally that to get uh, some more buy-in, but yeah, we'll talk about that in a sec, but yeah. So 40 firefighters and police officers that were screened in terms of their metabolic profile, looking pre-diabetic and with these, like, actually we should talk about the, what you, what we, or we, I'm, as if I was part of the team. You're part <laughs> of the team, man. You're on, you're on. Well, I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I want to be part of the team because this is what we want to do. What elements like nutrition was obviously a key part, but what other elements was involved to improve their metabolic profile? And for screening, what were kind of the things that were, were used? And the reason I think it's important because a lot of people, they think, you know, their BMI, body mass index is fine. And so, or they don't look that overweight. And they, they think that this person must be metabolically healthy. Whereas there's more nuance to that. Like, it's mm-hmm. not just about your weight. It's, you know, there's other elements to that. So maybe you could speak to that, Rob. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the people who put this together are way smarter than I am. I just arrived on the scene and, and put a little bit of, of input into what they were doing. But I mean, it, it looks very similar to many standard medical intakes. Like you do an extensive HRA, a health risk assessment questionnaire. So it's like, age, gender, ethnicity, family background. And I mean, we we collect a lot of data around that. And like if somebody had a family history of diabetes or cardiovascular disease, that already immediately kind of shuffled them from, we have no idea what your risk is. And we automatically move them into a medium to to high risk category, sight unseen. Like we, we just pretty much made that assumption. 
And, and that HRA was pretty comprehensive. It was a good three or four pages of questionnaires that then had some data sorting and kind of machine learning that would look at it and correlate it to the blood work that we did. And the blood work included like the standard kind of metabolic profile, uh, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, fasting glucose, C-reactive protein. But the thing that was really kind of the, the magic in this is this thing called the LPIR score, the lipoprotein insulin resistance score. And this uses this technology called an NMR to look at just literally everything that's in a blood sample. And there's there are a zillion things. You get little spikes when you run an NMR in this way. Most of the spikes, we don't even know what they are yet. Like we're still in the process of categorizing, okay, this is lysine, that thing is is valine, you, you know, and, and all this type of stuff. But they have done these regression analyses where they're able to establish a relationship between the LPIR score and insulin sensitivity. So in normal circumstances, we use what's called a HOMA IR score, which is looking at kind of the total insulin secreted over time. And we can use that to kind of inform where somebody is on that insulin sensitive, insulin resistant spectrum. But it's kind of expensive and it, it, it's somewhat invasive and, and slow to do, whereas this LPIR score is just immediate. It's very, very trustworthy. But we combined all that information. And then based off of that, we would assign a risk category of very high risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk. And the low risk people, we just kind of kept an eye on, but we, that really wasn't who was in this, this initial batch of folks, this initial batch of folks. We, again, we kind of stacked the deck. Like we went after the people that we knew were metabolically unhealthy based off of both the HRA and this advanced testing. And I just have to say as an aside, when we first did this process 10 years ago now, it was about a thousand dollars per person to run this. Mm -hmm. because innovation has kept motoring along on this, it's $50 to do the same test now. Yes. And this is one of the things that I, I get in it, it, it. Man, it's really contentious stuff, but I'm a big fan of markets used in an effective way to sort things out and to innovate and to, to get prices down. So even though we had these great returns on investment previously, that was with a blood panel that literally is 20 times cheaper now than what it was then. When we identified where these folks were, then we generally sorted people into kind of a lowish carb paleo type diet. They interfaced with both a health coach, an exercise physiologist, and typically a dietitian, in addition to, to talking to their primary care physician who was part of their like uh, police and fire union, like their yearly physicals and all that stuff. What was cool about this is the chief of police, the chief of fire, the mayor, the city council, we're all on board with this. And that, again, is part of the magic of why it went well there and has honestly been a little bit difficult to replicate in other places because it's been hard to get all of that the kind of backing around that. But virtually everybody in that story, we had run this testing on them and they were all sick. And a couple of them we had labeled dead man walking. Like, mm. They were a disaster. And so in getting their health improved, they were very committed to improving the health of their, their police and fire. And so because of the hypervigilant state that these folks experience, because of the shift work that they experience, they will always have some degree of kind of metabolic derangement because of the challenges associated with, with like waking up multiple times in the middle of the night to go on a, a call and changing shift work and whatnot. We did as much as we could plugging those gaps. Like we would have people wear blue blockers at night when they would be able to get outside during the sunlight hours, like take your shirt off, get sun on your body, you know, really, really do that. So we did other lifestyle features. We encouraged them to exercise. And even though it was kind of CrossFit inspired, because these people were in a high stress, high motor work already, we really dialed the intensity, the CrossFit type stuff down. So I would call it more circuit training. It was CrossFit inspired, but we didn't put names on the board. We didn't make it a contest. You know, like these people are already in a fight for their life, like every day as it was. They didn't need that added stress of trying not to come in dead last on a workout. So we did those things. And then finally, the final lever that we probably had the most control over the kind of beneficial outcomes was the diet. 
And uh, we did weekly check-ins with folks. It was a little bit of food logging. And again, because we tracked this over time, there was a cohort of people that weren't really doing well. And when we figured out, okay, they're definitely complying with what we're recommending, but we're not seeing things go in a favorable direction. We knew that within a given population, there would be some people that would likely do better on a higher carb, lower fat diet versus the inverse. And so we shifted those. And that was that was kind of the Reno risk assessment program. And I, I got to be honest, when when this thing first happened, I was like, in five years, we will have transformed medicine. And uh, we're 10 years downstream now. And we've had a modicum of success with things, but it, it, it's, I don't know what, you know, military is maybe the only thing bigger than like healthcare globally. That if you wanted to go in and try to create this systemic change, you would have more challenges doing it. Yeah. But Rob, when we talk with, sorry, if it's 22 million? No. $22 million. Yeah, 22 yeah. million. Yeah. And you, you might think that number is outrageous, but just to give, you know, some of the listeners a realistic uh, point of view, when people come to the intensive care unit, like our ICU, like cost related to that, that's 1% of your gross domestic product for people walking through that door. Okay. That's you're talking anywhere from 3000 to 10,000 a day, depending on how uh, sick they're coming in. So these numbers aren't crazy. And then you think about the time lost from work, mm -hmm. caregivers to help with that need to take time off for, for work as well. Like it's not crazy. And I'm going to call it out too. In my profession, there's a lot of metabolically unhealthy individuals. Like we just did a show on a colleague of mine that lost, he lost 30 pounds because of what he was seeing with COVID. He was using mm -hmm. the, like a lot of intermittent fasting, low carb approach. And I won't lie to you, there's a lot of people at risk. And so I know there might be a tough time buying in, but at the same time, when you know it improves lives, it reduces spending, especially when we're going to move in towards a more like costly, like baby boomers are, are mm -hmm. going into prime time healthcare utilization. Then you add COVID in the mix, like time is cooking. Yes. Like this is right. For this kind of thing. And I'm not a change manager. I'm just a lowly intensive care unit doc with a podcast, but I'm screaming. This is the reason we've been screaming this stuff th this month, guys, is because this can change. We need it to change. It's crazy. It's going to change. We just have a choice of whether or not it's kind of like Mad Max chaos, and then we rebuild it afterwards, or we figure out how to steward this thing into a soft landing. Back in 2005, the Congressional Budget Office, this is looking mainly at the United States, which we're worse than everybody else, but everybody else is in the same boat. But the Congressional Budget Office projected that the United States would basically be bankrupt from diabetes-related costs by like 2030, 2035. So that's just been this like ticking time bomb in the background and then COVID arrived and all that COVID did was took something that was going to take years or decades and compressed it into weeks and months. And I mean, look at the state of our economy, look at the state of our, our social infrastructure and whatnot. Like it has just been like a low level nuclear bomb dropped in that, that whole scene. And what, what's so heartbreaking to me is whether we're thinking about this longer term story which you you alluded to on the metabolic health or just dealing with COVID right now, we know that better metabolic health leads to better outcomes across the board, period, full stop. And this applies to everything else, to basic influenza, to everything else, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, hopefully it helps having these conversations and increasing the awareness out there. Because like, I mean, I was telling you beforehand, like weeks, weeks ago, I didn't know about this shit. I didn't know that you could reverse diabetes in weeks. I still am baffled at this. I mean, and the reason I do the research or our team does the research in costs is because to me, that's a needle mover. You mm -hmm. know, the decision mm -hmm. makers, if they could see the bottom line, an intervention is going to reduce your bottom line, like time to play, yeah. time to hustle. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping all these things will help. And I really like what you're doing too with, like the Healthy Rebellion community. I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to like that virtual platform that you've created. How long ago has this been? Um, Just a little you, over, uh, coming up on a year. Just coming a year up on already. A year. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe speak a little bit about how this came to be and what's going on in that community because I personally love this concept. Yeah. And so it gets a little wacky. 
a, a little over a year ago, I guess April of 2019, we noticed, we got up one day and our, our site traffic to my usual robwolf.com site had plummeted by about 97%. And we were kind of like, what the heck is going on here? And we were poking around, poking around, didn't really know what was going on. And then these news pieces popped up in which folks in the kind of low carb scene, the ancestral health scene, the Google update that had occurred had basically expunged a bunch of our material from the interwebs. And it just became, so like there was a kind of vegan documentary called What the Health? And it's, it's very well done. I don't agree with it. And I went literally minute by minute in this thing, like they would make a claim and I'd time index what the claim was, what the citation that they they cited, and then I would put in my my own piece to that. And it, it was 90 hours of work. It was this huge, huge process. And if you searched what the health, it was maybe the third or fourth thing that popped up in the, the front page return. After Google did this algorithm update, you couldn't even find it. Like you had to put in Rob Wolf, what the health to be able to find this thing. And what's interesting, and this gets a little out into conspiracy theory land, but about six months prior, I guess, end of 2018, GlaxoSmithKline and Google had like a $680 million crossing of funds. And I forget which direction it, it went, but some people have made the case that Google is effectively a pharmaceutical company now. Like there's a, a case to be made that they're, they're more or less a, a pharmaceutical company or at least a significant slice of their business or, or the direction that they're headed in. And what, what's interesting is a good number of the people that were in that were affected by this algorithm update, they're pretty far out on the fringe. Like they're in the, the really strong anti-vaccine, which I'm this crazy guy that's actually pretty centrist on it. Like I really, I really think that doing more or less what we did as kids is a great idea and maybe staggering them out a little bit and you know, making sure the quality is good and everything. So I'm not anti-vax, but I'm also not totally bought in that is a a hundred percent benign process and we should have some some discussion around the pluses and minuses of all those sorts of things but i had never written anything about any of that it's so controversial that i was like <laughs> i step in a lot of piles of shit as it is like I, that's just one that i'm not gonna gonna step into but what's interesting is the low carb scene the venn diagrams with the anti-vaccine there's a lot of overlap there that's over and one could make the case too that from a metabolic disease perspective this low carb approach is really effective at mitigating that and if you look at some some other trends like uh sugary uh cereal sales in the united states has been dropping right. sugary beverage sales have been dropping again it, it gets super conspiracy theory and i'm really not a conspiracy theory guy but there's some interesting stuff there but the the long and short is that we woke up one day and everything that I do to support myself that I've supported my my family for, you know, 15 years was basically non-viable overnight due to this algorithm update because nobody could really find what we were doing. And we kicked around some different ideas. Is this when we close everything up and move to Costa Rica and start a coconut farm and just call it good, which isn't terribly unappealing, you know, there would be some serious upsides to that. But I really do think that there's still something to this medical risk screening process that we, you know, kind of have spun up in Reno. And I did some work with the Chickasaw Nation for two years. They had learned about the Reno project and I went and did some work with them. They developed this, this thing internally called the Unconquered Life Initiative because they're facing the same problems everybody else is only again at an accelerated rate. Like 80% of their population is in that diabetic, diabetes type type range. And it is crushing them both with regards to the negative impact on their health and their culture, but then also just the cost. Like it, it will drive them into insolvency if they don't get out ahead of all this stuff. So I had learned a lot of different things in all these processes. And I, we launched this thing called the Healthy Rebellion, which is off of all of these social media platforms. It's its own standalone platform. The woman who founded that, Gina Bianchini, is a really outspoken advocate of like freedom and free access to information. And so I, I felt secure that she would really live by those ideals and we would have a safe place to kind of do the things that we wanted to do. And so the goal of the Healthy Rebellion is to liberate a million people out of the sick care system. 
And we have this three point process that we look at for defining that. The first one is what is your metabolic health? You know, like we need to know where you are on this kind of metabolic health or disease spectrum. Once we get that figured out, if you're healthy, then great. We're going to help you maintain it. If you're not as healthy as you would like, then we're going to figure out how to help you. And that's where we get you plugged in with a smart functional medicine doctor and also health coaches because people cannot generally affect the changes necessary alone. Like there have been billions of dollars spent on apps trying to get people to Twitter their way to better health. And it just doesn't work. It's too hard. It's, a, you know, we need social support to be able to do that stuff. And so we've got that screening, we've got the, you know, interfacing with health support. And the third part is really particularly germane to the United States, which is I really encourage people to figure out ways to get outside of the third party payer system. The insurance system in the United States is the most broken Frankensteinian monster that you could imagine. Like you couldn't, you would be hard pressed to sit down and engineer something this broken from the start, you know, but it's been a process of both, I think, good intentions gone wrong and bad intentions that have, have gone even, even better that leave us with our current situation. But in the United States, there are provisions for these things called health chairs. And it's historically been within religious groups where they have an exemption where they can aggregate money within a, a group. And what's interesting there is that they can kind of have inclusion exclusion criteria. So they can delineate, we will cover these things. We won't cover these things. And everybody agrees to do that. And what's fascinating is these health shares do a really good job of basically negotiating a cash price on the things that they do. So their costs are not increasing at this exponential rate that we see within all the rest of, of healthcare. So we've been working to either partner with or develop our own health share so that we could then start moving people into this process. And, and a critical feature of this is that people have to, we need to support folks. We need to provide opportunity. We need to, to do all that. But then on the back end, like people need to have their feet held to the fire. There has to be accountability. There has to be skin in the game for that whole thing to come together and really work. But that's probably way more of an answer than what you're gunning for on what the healthy rebellion is. But that that's ultimately what it is. No, it, it, that's fantastic, Rob. And I there's a lot to discuss here. One of the key parts to, in my opinion, which you touched on, which is really underrated is the accountability slash community, which, you know, it's, as you said, you could look up, you could Google as much as you want, the audio books you want, the podcast on how to, you know, get motivated and get hustling. But you, in my opinion, you really need that community piece. And you wrote mm -hmm. about it actually in the Wired to Eat. Like it's actually part of, in general, well-being and, and how to be better in life. But I think that's a very important point. You know, and just to summarize the rebellion, key to success, knowing what your profile is, your metabolic mm -hmm. profile is, getting access to people that are going to help you and creating that sense of community. And I really like that out of the box thinking in terms of, you know, when it comes to insurance, because, yeah, we've had a, a guest on or two talking about the U.S. insurance system, which is, I don't know how much you know about Canada, but basically you and I walk into a hospital we don't have to worry about anything in terms of our checkbook, except for maybe if you want a semi-private room or not. Right. You know what I mean? So I love the, I love what you're doing. So can you illustrate maybe a bit about the health coaching, the support point of view, because this is not necessarily a part of traditional healthcare, like having that support. Yeah. And I argue, you know, once again, I think we both agree, we can't just keep doing what we're doing, but you know, maybe this is a part of an element that would, once again, might be cost effective. You have that support, you have that community, you have that health coaching, mm -hmm. you know, like, so what does that look like in terms of the health coaching piece? Yeah, you know, so there are some interesting examples of stuff like this, like the Singapore healthcare model is interesting to me in that it is universal coverage. So like everybody's in that pot, but the way that they do it is this thing called an HSA, a health savings account. So if you have a standard job, then you put some pre-tax dollars into this account and like you've got a deductible and, and whatnot. Folks that are low income, the government puts money into that account, but then it's your money. 
and you get to decide what you do with it. And part of what they, they have within the Singapore model, if you want to throw a lot of money at a, at a, to your point, like if you want private one-on-one -on -one, you know, stuff, pay a little bit more, you've got that. They have a ton of group health. So, and a good friend of mine, Chris Kresser, is rolling out this program called the ADAPT 180 program, where you as a physician talking to one diabetes patient at a time is remarkably inefficient, mm -hmm. both with your time and expertise. And also it's just kind of scary and like isolating for that individual. And so what different places like Singapore and their model they've done, these newly diagnosed diabetics, they all show up at a group meeting, 10, 20 people, and then one physician or one diabetes educator marches everybody through, this is what your situation is, and here's how we're gonna help you. And here are the health coaches that can interface on a day-to-day -day level because the things that people need to succeed with this diet and lifestyle change are important, but it's hand-holding, it's support, it's a shoulder to cry on, you know? It's not understanding how to deal with like a pneumothorax or something like that. Like, a, you know, the physician's role is really at this very high level of determining, is this person going to die right now? And if yes or no, and then, you know, what do we need to do to start affecting change? But then so much of that change is just this chop wood, carry water process of needing to show up every day and have accountability. And that's where that health coaching interface, I think, is really important. And one ray of, of hope within the U.S. system is in the new ICD-10 diagnostics code, they have a code for health coaching now. And this is so that they can start doing research around the efficacy of health coaching. But something that needs to change within medical practice is these health coaches, these mid-level kind of practitioners need to be given enough latitude to really help people. Like if the doctors want them to help on nutrition, then they need to say, go be a chief, go do it and not micromanage what that, that process exactly is. You don't want bad advice, but that's where like some education and credentialing can come in. But this group health model, the health coach model, it becomes really efficient. You can help a lot of people. And then, I mean, everything from like weight loss challenges to Navy SEALs, they move people through in cohorts. You come together as a team and you move through the process as a team and you have help and support so that that group model is really powerful, really efficient. And then when you, you graft in that middle level of health coaches that support doctors, nurses, pharmacists, then it, we have the potential for something really magical. And that is a place where technology could be a great addition to this story. Texting, group apps, you know, all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Rob, I mean, you're nailing it because like, I'm just thinking at so many levels, like one, you know, every doc says they don't have enough time, but if you, if you have, you're seeing more than one client patient, what, what have you, that's a win. Mm -hmm. I know in on where we live, there's starting, I believe to have uh billing practices for groups, which once again, that's, that's a win. The virtual side, definite win. You and I, I mean, you, you've done, I think a purple belt in mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu. Yeah. I've played hockey my whole life and all that stuff. When you're in that group and you're together, you do not want to let each other down. No, no. You're part of that team. You're going to hustle. You're going to find that extra gear when uh, things are, when you feel like you don't have it. This is, to me, as I'm hearing this, this is really the future. This is the way to go because once again, we can't keep doing the same shit over and over again and expect different results. And you know, it's, it's interesting. Part of the reason why this model came about, the 20th century was really about dealing with infectious disease. Like it, it really was. We developed some early vaccines. We had sulfa drugs, I think in the 1920s, 1930s. Then it wasn't until the 40s and 50s that, you know, like penicillin derived antibiotics came on the scene. And most of that doctor-patient interaction grew out of, okay, you're sick, you have an infection, here's the thing that's going to fix you. And it worked pretty well. But then for dealing with cardiovascular disease, like, it's a joke. You know, you have to get, it, it's like trying to find a pubic hair and a bowl of spaghetti to find the benefit of, like, statins for heart disease versus the comparison of, like, if you have a bad case of strep and you go on the right antibiotic, it is magic. It yeah. works. It works every time. 
but we built a whole medical paradigm around this prescriptive model. It's like, here's the thing you need to do, which is take one, you know, before every meal, don't take it with milk. That's easy. But if you're trying to rejigger somebody's diet and lifestyle and get community and deal with the stressful features of their life, that prescriptive model just fails. So part of what we're dealing with is all the legacy infrastructure that grew out of basically conquering chronic infectious disease. But now we're in chronic degenerative disease is the thing that's really going to get us. And we need an entirely different model for that. And it's going to be painful shifting, you know? Absolutely. But, you know, I I think a lot of my colleagues, we're just tired of being useless. Like, I hate to be uh, so black and white about it, but just add that third antihypertensive, add that third diabetic medication, add the statin. Oh, my muscles are aching. We're just Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid. And like, I'll be honest, I don't want to see you if you don't have to come in. Because like, when you go through this admission, you're not coming out the same person. And Doc, would would anybody in emergency medicine tolerate that type of process? Like a heparin clamp or so? Would they tolerate just like failure after failure after failure where the person dies right there in front of you? Absolutely not. They would never yeah. tolerate that. But we tolerate this stuff because a person doesn't die there. Yeah. They go home and they continue their process of dying. You know, it's just kind of stretched out. But that's where, like, taking some notes out of emergency medicine and trauma medicine, like, they do amazing work with that. They do amazing retro engineering of, like, well, why is this person failing here? You know, like, there was all the discussion do you provide fluids to somebody who's got a gunshot wound or a bad wound. And there was back and forth on it. But over the course of time, they're like, okay, here's our protocol for doing this. And they were really able to refine that. But the chronic disease process is so much more global and difficult to get its arms around. But we're really complacent and like, well, it's kind of the best we could do, but we would never tolerate that in emergency medicine. Yeah. And I just, I keep harping on this, but we are, as docs in the medical community, the resistance to change is unparalleled. Like we, we're dinosaurs. Like you could come up with new evidence-based practices that you think are, would benefit patients and it will take years for them to be mainstream. And so I think there's so many, as you mentioned, like things, elements that stack against us, but I think we just need to continue to have the the dialogue and our like target audience are young upstart healthcare professionals. Like we, our team at Solvent Healthcare, we love you guys, almost 20 medical students, because they hear this and they're like, okay, we see the problem. You know, I don't want to give grandma another statin when, hey, maybe if I just tell her to slow down on the carbs, take a walk after your, your dinner, you know what I'm saying? Maybe this is enough, you know? So I think the awareness piece is where we've been focusing on. And when you get enough of a group to say, hey, you know, maybe this is this is enough. Like maybe we, we need to really rethink this. Maybe change will happen because as far as I'm concerned, we can't just keep doing this. I'm sorry. We just can't keep like, if my mom has to be thrown on an antihypertensive, you know, we're having a discussion now. Hey right. mom, let's think about this. Let's, you know, cause we don't want to start that cycle. That cycle med after med after med. Anyways, I'm, I'm ranting now, <laughs> Rob. No, I get it because you, you're in the trenches. You see it every day and you've seen it for a long time. Yeah, it's just frustrating. One thing that I was dying to pick your brain on is I think it's been clear to people insulin resistance is bad. We know that, you know, the worry about having these high carb diets is pro inflammation, et cetera. So, in your opinion, what are some of the other methods that people can improve their glycemic uh, profile or or reduce their insulin resistance or increase their, I should say, insulin sensitivity. Any other things that come to mind aside from typical diet recommendations? Yeah. You know, sleep is is arguably as, if not more important, an individual who is short slept an hour a night for five days is as insulin resistant as a type two diabetic by the end of that process. Now, some sleep can undo it. Some other things like exercise, like particularly uh, strenuous resistance training can dramatically improve 
insulin sensitivity. And it's, it's interesting when you look at the activity patterns of hunter gatherers and pre westernized cultures, they're not, they're not triathletes, but they're definitely not couch potatoes. And they have a lot of activity broken up throughout the day. And for years, I've had this notion that the bulk of our glucose disposal should happen from activity, not from insulin. Like if you really get in and think about the primary actions of insulin, insulin, you know, you've got the beta cells of the pancreas, their next door neighbor is the alpha cell that releases glucagon. Mm -hmm. And the, really arguably the first thing that insulin does is turn off the release of glucagon because ostensibly like we have elevated glucose levels that causes an insulin release. So we don't need glucagon turned on right then. Mm -hmm. And then with that down regulation of glucagon, then we modify the release of, of glucose out of the liver. And then it's only really quite far down the road that we get to like the systemic features of insulin, you know, modifying the input of glucose into our, our muscles and our fat, fat cells and even into our brain. But, you know, resistance training just plays this huge role in improving that story. I think for both men and uh, postmenopausal women, taking a little look at their iron saturation and seeing if they are a little bit carrying too much iron, doing some simple blood donation can bring that iron down. And what that does is it can reduce the systemic inflammatory process that excessive iron can produce. Any type of systemic inflammatory state makes us more insulin resistant. Like when we get a cold, a flu, and an infection, we tend to see elevated blood glucose levels because we have some inflammation occurring from the immune response. And this is kind of another spot where I do, not everybody needs to eat a paleo diet, but if folks are casting around for some things to do that kind of like no grains, no legumes, no dairy, 30 days, see how, see how you do with it. It's an amazing reset to figure out if you have some gut driven inflammation that could be leading into this, this bigger picture of insulin resistance. So the um, resistance exercise, sprint intervals are fantastic, improving sleep, and then really taking a, a peek at the kind of iron status. And there's other things like vitamin D will help, proper omega-3, omega-6. Like there's there's a lot of different things that, that go from there, but I think it gets to be diminishing returns from that point. Yeah, fair enough. But in terms of, I'm all always about 80-20 or like the mm -hmm. biggest bang for your buck. It sounds like obviously what we eat and then probably sleep would be the kind yeah. of like the high level one, which we're, we're still... I know solving healthcare crew, we still need to do a sleep episode, but it's coming. I think we're, we're good we're friend of mine, Dr. Kirk. Dr. Kirk Parsley. Would yeah, be a we've great been, one. Yep. yeah, I emailed him. I think he'll be on, hopefully. If he doesn't get back to you, tell me because he's a slacker. He doesn't get back to people as fast as he should. He went to jujitsu with us last week. He is a big, strong man. And, and is but, he a big uh, guy? Oh. I mean, you can never tell on, you know, because. Uh, Video, He's like six two, two hundred and forty five pounds, and not seriously. Much on him. Yeah, he is a brick shit house. Two forty five. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have never. Oh, that is a shit house. That is a total shit house. Because, but uh, I will lean on him to get on your show. So just yeah. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. I'm gonna take you up on that right after Please this do. call. Actually, yeah. thank you so much. Because honestly, because I just think of our staff. I'm always thinking about our staff, our nurses, our our docs. We do shift work. Okay. I know if we did a motorbike profile of a lot of us, we'd be poor. Sleep is shit, guaranteed, just because of the nature of the job. And then the food we eat, like even, like I'll tell you full stop, we got a tradition on the weekend. We bring bagels in on Saturday and Sunday. I know I ain't helping anybody, you know, right. except for that maybe there's spirits a little bit that there's food coming in. Right. But yeah, like I think, you know, we really should, because I'm always about being an example. You know, I I'm try to be fit for a reason. But I think, yeah, like when it comes to the biggest bang for your buck, food, sleep, and it'll be great to talk to Kirk about the sleep hacks because once again, for us, it's so tricky. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, that, that shift work community, that's where diet ends up taking on even more of a prominent role because police, military, fire, medical professionals, new parents, yeah. sleep's just going to be a problem. Like you do everything you can to improve what you get. But then beyond that, food ends up being potentially the most powerful level that lever that you still have in that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a bias towards resistance training. I know we don't lift in weights, push in weight. I know we don't talk about it that much, but I mean, that's for me personally, such a 
great stress relief. You get the upside mm-hmm. about the insulin, improving your insulin resistance, and you feel good, look good. Yep. Push some weight, kids. Quadcast Nation, tell me that wasn't amazing. Rob, if you get a chance to listen to this, we love you. Thank you so much for doing the show. If you want to follow us, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at Quadcast. Leave any comments at quadcast99 at gmail.com. For those that missed our low-carb keto conference, you can find that at solvinghealthcare.ca backslash low-carb. Guys, we're going to continue the dialogue on getting everyone healthier, changing the boogie. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode, and uh, we'll connect again real soon. Peace.